All right. Hey, welcome back to the MMA Viva section. This is Zane Simon. I'm joined today by once again by uh, Victor Rodriguez. We're here to break down World Series of Fighting 19 going on this weekend. It's uh, actually a pretty good main card. Surprisingly, I, I was really pretty fascinated by it, looking at it. Um, not that exciting an undercard. We might not focus on that too much, but uh, thanks for joining me for this, Vic. <laughs> it's good to be uh, able to sneak back into the country to join you and do one of these beautiful, beautiful things that we're doing. Here. That, that's right. So, I, I, yeah. I, I know how much you've missed the sweet taste of freedom. And uh, I'm glad that you were able to make it, you know, make it here for just for this show. That that means a lot to oh, me. Believe me, it's quite sweet. Yes, indeed. <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, we're you know not. I don't know. It's been kind of a busy month for World Series of Fighting. Just to get into like a little bit of what's been going on with them since their last show, mostly. Uh, it's been busy for signings. That's been, I mean, fortunately for them, that's been their big news over the past, uh, over the past month or two. It's not been sort of the constant, miserable, impending doom of failure that it seems like it would be over the past six months. But lately, it's just been some new fun fighters they've got and they're taking on and new guys to watch. Yes, and uh, not only that, but it's it's really, uh, they seem to have bounced back. They seem to have made themselves, after all of their blunders uh, within the last maybe six to eight months, they've really gotten a lot of things together, and uh, I guess they're, they're finally finding what their model is going to be, what the product more or less should be from here on in, at least for a good while. Uh, and and I'm, I'm enjoying this. This is good. Uh, first signing of note. Very, very big possibilities here. Abu Bakar Nurmagomedov, the brother of one Khabib Nurmagomedov, who's also making waves in the UFC. Um, I haven't seen anything on him yet, but I hear really good things, and uh, it's it's going to be pretty exciting to see what happens or where they just how they decide to bring him along in World Series of Fighting. Oh uh, yeah, I mean Tom and I scouted him, and we had him as our number three welterweight prospect in the world. Mm. And, you know, I mean, watching you, you watch him out there, and he looks a lot like his brother. He's not the same athlete. Like, Khabib is the rare sort of, I mean, you know, in, in our scouting terms, he's like a seven athlete on a scale of one to seven. Mm. Um, he's the kind of guy that is basically guaranteed to contend for a world title at some point, if not win it. You know, you watch him even going up the circuit and all that is just sort of like, you know, he, he's really obviously a special athlete. And his brother's not that special athlete, not that same ridiculously strong, explosive guy, but he's got the same game, and he's not a, sl you know, he's not a slouch of an athlete. He's better than average for the UFC these days, I would say. But he's, you know... It's all, it's that same basic high pressure, grappling, top control, ground and pound, focused game plan with big single strikes on the outside. Kind of thing that's pretty guaranteed to find a decent level of success fighting in the U.S. Right. So I'm well, excited, good. definitely. All right. Uh, second signing of note. This actually got a lot of good mainstream attention, which <clears throat> they sorely needed, was the signing of uh, the pride of the Pacific Northwest, Phoenix Jones. Um, it, it's ben true. Fedor. Finally, finally, finally getting into a major organization after having 20-odd amateur fights. Uh, and now he's going to be fighting Emmanuel Wallow, I believe, next month. Uh, it should be the, the event that they're having in Jersey. I forget where it's going to be. Or when, I'm sorry. Yeah, the idea that it took as long as it did, and it, it took, like, a ESPN special on him. Yes. It, that, that just kind of tells me that, like, low level, you know, these sort of second-tier MMA promotions really aren't doing their homework. Because how would you not sign a guy like Ben Fodor? I mean... 
even if he's not a great MMA talent and he's looked like an all right one, he doesn't look bad. Even if he's not, even if he wasn't a great one, he's guaranteed tickets. Like he's only money in the bank, you know. Yeah, there's there's very little possibility that they're going to take a bath on this because this guy's, you know, he, he's he's very. Um, you have the mystique, you have the R, you have the whole superhero which thing, which kind of lends him a bit of a tough guy credibility thing. But the guy has fought some pretty legit guys. He's actually faced on the amateur scene some very tough opposition. Obviously, when they were younger, when he was younger, but now that he's fighting pro and now that he's uh, you know got this bit of uh, uh, resurgence and, and an even greater amount of attention uh, from uh, mainstream outlets, now he's able to be far more marketable and be an asset that really I don't know how you can mismanage that. I mean, it's, it's got to be pretty hard to mess that up. Although an interesting note is that uh, he had some sort of problems with. Um, who he was going to join, who he was going to sign with. There was some sort of deal where they wanted some sort of joint marketing deal with uh, action figures and all this stuff, but they'd take some of the licensing or they'd ask him to stop being a superhero so he doesn't get injured, things of that sort. So, I mean, you know, it, I can imagine that that's maybe where things get a little more complicated. But, hey, I'm happy for him. I'm happy for them. I think this is going to be a match that will work out really well. So this is a win-win. Yeah, I mean, I'm excited. It's one of those things that, like, you know, as much as I love and sort of base most of my coverage on the sporting aspects of MMA and all that and base most of my interest there, I really love to see new personalities and, like, fun people in the sport. Like, it, it you know, if you're going to watch a thousand fighters a month and, you know, watch MMA constantly... It's nice to see people who are going to be just a bit different and a bit out there, even if they're not necessarily going to be huge stars or anything like that. It's just good. It, it it breaks up the monotony of white guys with wrestling and boxing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and shave heads and all that, the Bob Arum trifecta, rolling on the ground and all that other good stuff. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I'm definitely a, a, actually somewhat excited to you know see what Ben Fodor can do in World Series of Fighting. Let's see. Also, they were just in the news. World Series of Fighting was just in the news with uh, Ali Abdelaziz talking about shady managers in MMA and how fighters need to stay stay, stay away from them. That, yeah, you know, for all the things, for all of his misgivings, this is probably one of the best things he's done because he dropped a lot of truth. Uh, when he talked about that subject, and uh, I, I wasn't aware that people were doing that. When it comes to foreign fighters, you know, their their manager will pull them aside. According to him, these are his allegations. Yeah, that, that uh, a manager will open a joint account with the fighter and say, "Hey, don't worry, we're going to handle your finances here in the U.S. and pay your taxes and do all that other good stuff." And then the fighter ends up feeling like his pocket's a little light, and there's good reason for that. So now, yeah, that that um, I don't know how much of a can of worms this opened here, but that that's actually pretty interesting that he that he said that. And it's kind of overdue because if this has been happening and it's been for as long as he said, how come no one's ever said anything before? Uh, it, it it definitely raises more questions than anything else, but most of them are very good questions that need to be asked. Well, I have to say, when Ab Ali Abdelaziz is telling you you've got a problem with your management, you probably have a big problem with your management. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> oh, man, that's like, that's like uh, you know, Cat Williams, you know, and when he said, you know, when you're getting arrested with Suge Knight, you got a problem, you know, that's, that's where, so, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, Ali, he seems to do right by his clients. I mean, he wouldn't still be... Yeah, he wouldn't have worked with as many people and have the reputation that he has with some of the higher guys like Frankie Edgar and company. Um, but uh, yeah, this 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 is bad. This is really bad stuff. But uh, yeah, at least someone's bringing attention to it. Unlikely, but at least it's out there. Yeah, it's true. Um, other than that, no, I can't think of any other any other big news. World Series of Fighting wise, they've mostly, like I say, it's just kind of been like good to hear about them actually picking up talented fighters and, you know, putting together salt, you know, some more shows and kind of keeping the wheels on. 
we're forgetting one thing. Oh. Uh, there has been a bit of controversy with the uh, light heavyweight tournament that has been uh, that we had talked about previously. Vinny Margalesh from Titan FC. Uh, apparently, there's some dispute as to his contract, as he's been. Uh, he says he's joining World Series of Fighting for the tournament. Titan FC says no. So now we're having another dispute situation. Uh, I'm not sure what kind of resolution we're going to reach or how soon, but that's something to keep an eye on at least because that would certainly improve the tournament, I think. Yeah, that's actually one of the things I think is starting to come to a bit of a head in MMA. I mean, I don't know what the eventual fallout will be, but... Exclusive contracts, I mean, like, it's, you know, the, the UFC is obviously, there. it's starting to bring attention to them just because of their Reebok deal and all these other th ways in which they're structuring fighters to look and act like employees. You're going to wear this, and you're going to get tested all the time, and all that, and then, you know, we can't, we won't let you work anywhere else. Right. But in regional MMA, especially, like, exclusive contracts are the devil, honestly. Like, it, it's just, I, I, you know, I love watching a lot of these organizations, but you got to think, like, if you're fighting for World Series of Fighting, you're fighting for Titan FC, you're fighting for almost any of these organizations, and you're getting, you know, they, they put on maybe, like, 12 events a year, maybe, and you've got an exclusive contract with them, like, that's terrible. Yeah, and and not only that, you have some of these organizations that don't have as consistent a schedule. So, for example, yeah. you'll fight on a card, say, now in March, let's say, let's say this card. And you don't know when the next event is going to be. It could be maybe in April, but it might not be until October. Uh, what do you do in the meantime? You know, and then you have the exclusivity clause, which means you can't go out and fly or try it elsewhere. You can't go to Japan. I mean, what do you do? So, I mean, it also depends on what kind of contract you have and all that other jazz. But as far as what is – as it relates to this particular situation, uh, that whole – thing with the exclusivity deal in the regional scene. I'm not sure how that's going to get fixed, but it, it it's going to have to change soon. I don't know if this is a... It seems a little untenable to me. I, I don't know how that's going to last at all. Yeah, I think it's... It, it, it'll just... It's one of those things that I wonder how much that might come out of this whole attempt at a lawsuit that fighters are filing and some of the fallout from that. It, I mean, usually the kinds of, like, bad sports contract law only tend to get fixed when athletes have actually gone and taken organizations or people to court and asked the courts to start addressing and you know saying what kind of rules can you put in place for these athletes cuz a lot of them get really shady contracts and it's just you know no ability to really challenge them this is true this is true so um Anyway, that's kind of a weird note to then branch, branch off into this card and talk about it a little, but here we are, and we got nothing else to talk about in terms of grander stuff. Uh, this is, like I say, it's a decent card. The main card is full of recognizable fighters, interesting fighters. The undercard is not. There is not really anyone I recognize on the undercard. Some guys that I've maybe seen in a World Series of Fighting show or two, but nobody I've really been watching out for or looking forward to. Is there anyone that caught your eye, Vic? Yeah, well, I mean, it should be noted that this seems to be following the pattern that we have noted a few months ago of World Series coming into a territory, uh, absorbing most of the talent, or basically co-opting a regional promotion and then working off of that from there. Uh, a lot of the talent here is from Ring in the Cage and from uh, WFF, which is pretty big in the um, Arizona area, bringing in some of the talent from California, Utah, Colorado, and some portions of western Texas. Um, some of the Jackson guys have competed for some of these organizations, and so now we've got uh, essentially a Rage in the Cage card presented by uh, World Series of Fighting with some other, as you mentioned, more recognizable names at the top. Uh, obligatory disclaimer, <laughs> this is not to disparage the talent of any fighter just because we're not going to speak of, of, in the most glowing of terms doesn't mean we don't like you or that you're not good. It's just that, you know, look, 
you got some exciting matchups here. They're not as notable, but they would at least make for some interesting um, styles, uh, clashes. And, 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 again, they look good stylistically on paper. Uh, I do just want to highlight right now two fighters on the undercard that seem like they have a good amount of upside. Uh, the first of them is the one who's opening the card, Joe Madrid. 3-1 uh, and one is an amateur. 4-2 uh, and two is a pro. And uh, very active, very, uh, very big on using his clinch. His boxing is a little better than just basic, you know, and he's really good at scrambling and getting to his opponent's back. Um... He's he's got some growing to do, as a lot of these guys are, but uh, do I should say. But uh, the, he he seems to have some promise, and I yeah I'm getting a feeling we're going to be hearing from him eventually later on. Also, Dan Huber, two and zero as an amateur, three and two as a pro, still improving though. Uh, very very strong, just absolutely relentless when it comes to pouring it on with strikes and when it comes to submission attempts. Um, more so in the submission department, you know, he's he's much more of um, he's he's much more of a guy who will use his weight on a guy. He will grind a guy a bit, but he always looks for those openings. And he's had some fights where he's really looked very very good. So I got a feeling we're going to be seeing some more of him as well. Other than that, again, some pretty exciting stuff uh, matchups, but not necessarily guys that you know, are going to be maybe on a future World Series of Fighting card or anything like that. But still very much worth watching. Yeah, it's, it's just, you know, I actually do like that thing where they're now put, just getting a regional event sort of as their undercard. I think that actually makes a fair bit of sense for them instead of trying to support an undercard themselves. Um, yes. It keeps them a lot freer, I think, to maybe put on better, better top cards. So, uh, yeah, it, it's it's interesting to see, you know, all the rage in the cage guys on this show. Let's see if any of them make a big impact off of it. Yes. Um, getting to the main card now, we've got a UFC vet and a uh, guy that has been kicking around the regional scene for a while, also Rage in the Cage, and more recently M1 Global, Clifford Starks is taking on Eddie Arzmendi after a late switch from Krasimir Mladenov, which I actually would have liked to see because that would be kind of a wrestle-boxer versus wrestle-boxer fight. And uh, Starks... I don't know. The mo the only thing I really remember about Stark specifically from his UFC run is A, getting melted by Yoel Romero, <laughs> and B, uh, talking shit about Kim Kardashian. And I only remember that because I had to write that up. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, um, I, uh, the, the universe showed me some sort of mercy that I missed that because uh, that that's that's really, wow, okay. But uh, Clifford Starks, man, I mean, he's had a he's had a bit of a strange career. Um, definitely a wrestle boxer, as you mentioned. Um, not very much of a finisher. Not that it's necessarily a knock. Um, he did go one and two in the UFC. He beat Dustin Jacoby. Ended up losing by submission to Ed Herman, and as you mentioned, that earth shattering. KO uh, lost to Yoel Romero. That I almost fell out of my chair, literally, at it for that from that one. That was no one saw that one coming. Least of all Starks. Uh, he went two and zero in Bellator. Um, you know he's he's oh whoa hey hang on a second that was not supposed to happen. Okay here we go. Yay still handsome. All right. Uh, he's faced some respectable opposition, but he's been sort of in a strange um, post UFC limbo holding pattern type thing. Even though he's been winning. I'm not sure what to make of this matchup against Arizmendi. Uh, as much like yourself, I would have really preferred to see Mladenov. Uh, I think we were pretty high on him the last time we uh, talked about him. We really were excited to see uh, to, to see him go in there and do his thing. Arizmendi's 1-0 as an amateur with a loss, curiously enough, to Seth Bozinski. Uh 15 and 6 as a pro. He's fought for Rage in the Cage, M1, WFF. But he's also currently on a three-fight losing skid. Um... I, I'm not sure how this is going to work. Arizmendi had... Okay, he, here's his last three fights. December of 2011, August of 2013, and he's fighting now. So he's he's taking these year-and-a-half breaks between his last few fights. 
Um, I, I don't know what to make of that. I, I don't know how this is going to work for him at all. Uh, yeah, he, has, he seems like kind of like the prototypical late notice call up guy who's kicking around the gym and you know maybe his career hasn't been that great of late, but still wants to fight. Um, and you know he, he's he's a wild fun fighter, but he's not he's never been like a super high skilled competitive fighter kind of guy. Yeah, I mean when he gets loose, he gets very he turns into this exciting whirlwind of violence. But you know he leaves his chin up, and you know it's just forward, forward, hits, hits, hits. He mixes it up real well. I don't know how he's going to deal with a guy who's going to be able to take him down the way Starks will and use that sort of strength and weight that, that Starks implements in his games. So I, I really don't see many avenues for him to do that, even though he does have seven submission wins. He might be able to catch Starks with something. Uh, he's going to have his hands full, but I don't see much of a possibility of that. Yeah, I think Starks, this is probably a pretty good fight for him. It's a guy who doesn't wrestle and is not notably physically overwhelming against a big, strong wrestle boxer. So pro- probably another win for Starks. Um, now another matchup that I'm definitely looking forward to, Ed West, Timur Valiev. This should be a fun fight, and it's a fight that I'm really excited for because I think it's a perfect booking for Valiev. Um, he looks like a really fun talent, really exciting fighter, and Ed West is that perfect, like, scrappy challenge for... It, it, it's a perfect proving ground for young rising fighters. Yeah, I would have to agree with that. And Valiev, being a Jackson Winklejohn product, um, and, and for as exciting as his style may be, it's, it's, it's strange to me that he doesn't have more finishes on his record. And not that that's necessarily a detriment. It's just, you know, the, the, the ratio of amazing things that you, that you might see him do or that he's capable of versus the actual endings of fights. But still, look, he's 8-1. and one. All of his fights have been as a, as a professional. Um, he's still growing as a fighter. He's still sometimes a bit of a slow starter. He takes things step, step by step in terms of his positioning, you know. He's going to stay inside control for a good bit, work his way slowly to mount, and then just start doing everything from there. Uh, currently 2-0 in World Series of Fighting, and certainly someone to... Uh, I, I'm guessing they're grooming him carefully in terms of choosing his, the opposition that he'll face, not giving him too much, of, uh, uh, too much for him to handle up front, which is very much the best thing you can do. You know, we've talked about how fighters grow at different rates. And I think Ed West is going to be a, a very good challenge for him, and this is going to be a hell of a fun fight. Yeah, I mean, West is one of those guys who's like, he, he reminds me a lot of, um, oh, gosh, what's his, uh, James Krause. Mm. Like, you know, exciting, not, uh, exciting and skilled everywhere, but not dangerous anywhere. Like, you know, not really the kind of fighter who's really going to physically put it on you. Somebody who can take advantage of some opportunities if you really screw up, but who's otherwise just going to be a competitive, tough fight. You know, and obviously he had that awesome double tap head kick that a lot of people remember him for in Bellator. Yes, I remember that. Unfortunately, un- that is unfortunately the only knockout on his record. But yeah. man, if that's the only one you're gonna have, man, that's the one you want. <laughs> That would it be is. Great. Yes. But yeah, I think uh, the big he, reason that uh, Valiev doesn't have more t- more knockouts is honestly just that he's you know watching him fight. He's mostly like a kicker. He he doesn't have great hands. He's got a really high output athletic kicking game, and, which is actually kind of a proto. It's like one of those weird Russian prototypes. Is like the wrestler kicker. <laughs> That you see guys in, out there who don't have a highly developed boxing game, but are like, re, you know, sort of like, um, famously, uh, geez, God, my mind is shot. Who's the guy who retired really early in his career? Chechen. Mm, uh, I think I know who you're referring to. The Wild to. Wolf UFC fighter. Oh, man. No, I don't remember right now, actually. Oh, uh, former Strike Force fighter, 
fought Robbie Lawler, got blasted. Oh, Adlan Amagov, yeah. Adlan yeah, Amagov. Yeah. 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 Yes. Like, Adlan Amagov is very much that prototype. Like, dude rarely ever threw punches with almost, like, 90% kicks. You know? Yeah, well, hey, look, I mean, if that's... Uh... He will he will be developing eventually to to the point where he might be more confident with his hands, and maybe that's it too. Maybe he's just not you know he's just not comfortable with it to that point. But hey, the kid's got some major upside, man. I, I'm I'm ready to see it. And Ed West definitely not a slouch too. Nine submission wins as well. Uh, you know, but there's a certain kind of fighter that he fights when it comes to passing up to that next level that he's kind of, you know, like he got, he lost yeah. to uh, Horodeki way back in the day. Uh, he ended up losing to Mikovsky, no shame in that. He ended up losing to Eduardo Dantas, again, no shame in that, both sensational fighters. Um, will he be able to, I don't know, find a way to be Valiev? You know, I don't know. It, it's certainly possible. Uh, I'd certainly favor Valiev overall, but um, yeah, this, this is definitely worth watching. This is going to be a great fight. It is. Um, next up is actually, I think it's about that had totally escaped me weirdly for you know as somebody who's really watching for prospects and has been recently scouting a lot of light heavyweights. This is a surprisingly good light heavyweight fight for guys like on the rise in that you know in that weight class. There aren't many, but um, Jake Hewn was recently on The Ultimate Fighter, season 19, um, was beating the, the piss out of uh, Todd Monahan, I believe, before getting armbarred, and that was in like the entry bout to get in the house, and you know has since then rebounded and is... Uh, Let's see, has he even fought since then? Yeah, yeah. He's since then rebounded yeah. with two wins, uh, a unanimous decision, and a knockout. And he's facing Teddy Holder, who is just like Phil Baroni, light heavyweight power puncher. <laughs> Anytime we mention Phil Baroni, I just, I just have to smile. That man's led a life. But yeah, man, Jake Hewn. Um... Uh, this is uh, curiously enough. This is an alternate bout. This is for the uh, the winner gets a spot as an alternate in the uh, light heavyweight tournament that we have mentioned before as well. Uh, Jake Hewn, man, you know he's on a two win streak as you mentioned. He's fought in pro elite. He's fought, you know, he's been around on the regional scene. All of his fights have been as a pro, all ten of them. Uh, four finishes by strikes, one submission. He's uh, he's he seems like he's hungrier now that he's been off of uh, Ultimate Fighter. I, I really don't know how this will play out uh, against a guy like Holder, who's you know he's eight and one as a pro, one and zero as an amateur. He's you know got a few finishes by strikes and a few submissions. He's he's certainly uh, his last fight though was in August of 2013. Again, I'm always wary of seeing something like that happen. I, I don't know if it's been due to injury or just life circumstances, but um, yeah, I, I, that that always gives me a, a degree of pause. Uh, I, I like the possibilities though for this fight. I like what it could potentially lead to. Um, it, it seems like this won't be. It doesn't seem like this will be boring. Is what I like. No, I, I mean, I I think Hewn should win it. He's a much more technical kickboxer, a much more technical striker. Holder is just like he's a big powerhouse. He's like what you get when a bodybuilder goes into MMA. You know, <laughs> not pretty, not technical. Good, surprisingly good, dirty boxer. Like I say, reminds me a lot of watching Phil Baroni. Honestly, it's just that like, you know, if he lands on you with power, it's crushing power. Mm. But if he doesn't, he's probably going to gas out and get wrecked. And so far, light heavyweight is bad enough that he's been able to just tear through everybody he's faced, um, with the exception of one submission loss. But Hune seems, you know, he's the kind of guy, he's only lost by submission before. Um, he's a much more technical striker. I doubt that um, Holder is going to submit him because his submission game appears to be all like it's you know everything says arm lock it's all power top control top control 
straight arm bars, Kimuras, big man submissions, as you know, yes. as they call them. You're not you're not gonna see Darce chokes or any of that. And, you know, if your no. bicep doesn't fit around the guy's neck, it's not gonna happen. Yeah, so I, I think this should be a good fight, though. It's it's a fight that I you know I'd much rather see this than the fight after it, quite frankly. <laughs> oh, shots fired! Okay. Well, yeah. If we're gonna do that, then let's go right there. Let's uh, yeah. Let's see what's coming up with that. The let's, official uh... tournament bout for the light heavyweight tournament on this card: Tiago Silva, Matt Hamill. Part mm. dos. Oh, God, yeah. Boy, I mean, this is um, this is this is as unnecessary as Spaceballs too. Like, I, I don't, I don't see anything good coming out of this. Um, fun fact: uh, Matt Hamill fought Alexander Gustafsson back at uh, I was forget was it 133? I think it was at UFC event. Uh, yeah, UFC on I, Fuel TV two. Mm, was that the one? Oh, wait, no, I was, I'm looking at no, I'm looking at Thiago Silva. No. Sorry, oh, Matt okay, Hamill, no, fought no. yeah, Alexander Gustafsson, yeah, UFC 133, Evan yeah, Ortiz. It's, it's the one UFC event I never shut up about because it's the only one I've been to live. Um, back then, back then, it wasn't, you know, Hamill looked shot. Hamill did not look like, you know, the game had really passed him by. The wrestling-centric game will only get you to a certain point in the sport in general and especially in a division where you have rangy guys who are really focusing on their striking. And Hamill hasn't really seemed to have grown, you know. I I mean, you watch him in that fight with Rampage. And these are fights that are years ago, and he still hasn't progressed. And now he's taking on a guy like Thiago Silva who, you know, despite what we may think... You look at that fight against Feijal, you know, uh, for example. You know, he still has massive power. I, and if, if, we're, if the first fight between them is any indication, I really don't think this is going to be what World Series of Fighting might want it to be. Yeah, I mean, Silva's one of those guys, like, he's right at the end of his competitive career, just sort of, like, just falling off, and at light heavyweight, that doesn't necessarily mean quite the same thing it means in other weight classes because there's a lot more room to be bad. You know, we we've seen Shogun be a shell of himself for like the last half decade and still win half his bouts. Um, see that one? That one makes me sad. Why you gotta go for Shogun, man? Why you gotta? See, now I gotta get a tissue and cry because now I know. Man, I'm sorry. Shogun, man, come on. Shogun, come on. And and Hamill's in the same position. Yeah. He he he's been fighting for just about as long, but his game was always much less. I don't know. I mean, it wasn't much less competitive, I would say. But yeah, it's it's much more prone to falling off hard, because it. I mean. It's it, you know he was never even really like a great power wrestler almost like he was one of those guys that if he got in on you and then he could get a takedown and take you down and work you over on the ground and all that but in sort of like that uh, almost that Phil Davis way like if you could stop that mm-hmm. that wrestling and if you could stop some of the technique in his shot, then he was a very easy fighter to stop. You know? So, okay, well, I mean, much like much like the Phil Davis situation, it's not so much him getting you down, it's what he does afterwards. It's the positional advantages that he... the opportunities that he creates yeah. and the advantages that he has afterwards. Uh, and, and that's fine. But, you know, I'd, I'd have to... I have to somewhat disagree with you on who's fallen off harder. I think Matt Hamill's really... Far closer to done than than Tiago Silva because well, that, that, that was my the whole. That, that that's what I said. Oh, oh I'm sorry that I mis I misunderstood <laughs> that. No, then then no. Hey, we're we're totally in agreement, man. I mean, I yeah. I don't um, I you know, such a a guy who's had such a promising career, such a good career, who's a, who was perhaps not expected to do as well, and you know, for his own well-being, I really would rather he continue to be involved in some other way, coaching or, or something on that level. But, you know, look, if the guy wants to fight, that's fine, but I'm not going to be real comfortable seeing him get finished as hard as he's been finished uh, lately. 
So Yeah, it's never fun to see a guy keep fighting when he's constantly flirting with retirement and telling people that he's done and telling people that he doesn't you know, he's like, oh, I'm not going to fight anymore. And then next month you see him back in the ring. It's kind of the Jens Pulver situation where mm. at some point you're just like, oh, I'd really rather like, I don't even care if you retire or not. I'd really just rather you stop 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 talking about it because that's kind of the depressing part is you constantly saying I'm going to be done now and then coming back because that suggests yeah. that well, it, all sorts of badness. The, the saddest the saddest portion of that is exactly that it's the fact that you know you think you're done well what's bringing you back is it money is it the allure of the whole you know the buzz of the crowd you know and that's that's really sad in the end you know but hey. No, he's a grown man, so not much he can do. Yeah. So, on a happier note, our main event. This is a fight that should be great. I'm excited for this fight. Justin Gagey, Luis Palomino. Um, you know, we got a prospect on the rise versus a old vet, you know, one of the better lightweights in it, over the long haul outside the UFC, really. Um you know, he's been one of the most consistent performing lightweights. And I think Palomino's one of those guys I'm surprised by because I keep thinking, like, oh, you know, really, he's way past any reasonable prime, and he's been fighting for way too long. It's amazing that he's done well for as long as he have, has. And then I go and look, and he's really, like, right at the tail end of his prime. Like, this is a fighter who should just be about seeing the end of the best years of his career. He started back in 2006, and he's fought a lot since then. But, you know, that's not, you know, it, he's not one of those guys that's fought since uh, 1999. Like, uh, <laughs> George Patino, that's the guy that I constantly compare him to, who's been yeah. fighting, who it, it feels like has been fighting just, since yeah, who's been fighting since 1995? 1995 yes. was when George Patino. Patino is like the definition of OG when it comes to the fight game because I mean you got a guy who's been fighting since the inception of like you know the the height of the sort of Valetudo movement that brought forth guys like Vanderlei Silva and uh, you know Jose Landy Johns guys like that. Um, but I mean you know even though he's been even though Palomino's been around for you know, at this point about a decade professionally. Uh, you know he's he's had a very a curiously uh, successful career, which and and I'm sure we've asked ourselves this uh, before. Why hasn't this guy had an opportunity to fight in the UFC? I mean he's fought some very good guys who have eventually fought there, but um, man this this I don't think I I can't remember the last time I was this excited for a World Series of Fighting main event outside of maybe Arlovsky Rumble Johnson. Uh, this was. This was great booking right here, and I'm really happy to see this go out, the, the go on. Um, Palomino, yeah. 23 and nine, you know, 23 and nine over the course of nine years, man. That's that's pretty impressive, right there. Well, and you know, you look at the guys he's lost to, even recently. It was, you know, he's got a loss to Efrain Escudero, Luis Firmino, Pat Curran, Eve Edwards. Jonathan Brookins. Yes. It's. It, I think it's one of those things, and this is one of those things where I, t I try to convince people uh, of, like, Palomino is the kind of guy I want to see on tough because he's a guy who's probably lost right at the moment that he was on the verge of a UFC contract ev at every point in his career. Like, he has yeah. a loss every four fights, basically. <laughs> Yeah, that's actually that's actually pretty accurate. Yeah, just when you think, which is what happens with a lot of these guys from Tough. Yeah, like three fight win streak against sort of notable opposition, and you've looked really impressive with some of those. And you know, yeah, you know what? Bring him on tough. Like he's never had that opportunity, which is even stranger at lightweight, which is such a, a competitive and deep division, and 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 he's still holding on strong, man. I mean, he's still. We look at some of the guys he's won against. Like recently, he beat Patino, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Jay Z Cavalcante, who's probably not what he used to be but still solid. Edson Berto, uh, Derek uh, Cruikshank, and uh, Jorge Masvidal. I mean, he's on... Right now, it's just a 2-1 fight streak, but he's beaten some guys that uh, ended up being really, really tough later on. So I don't know what that says about where he's at now necessarily, just looking at his win-loss record. But looking at his recent performances, I mean, he's got a hell of a lot of power in, in his strikes. Um, 
his submission game, I mean, his scrambles to get to submission positions are pretty good. I don't know how well that's going to go against a guy like Gaethje, who has serviceable wrestling, really tough in a clinch. Um, I don't know, man. I mean, Gaethje's got 20 straight fights winning. I mean, he's he's 13 and 0 as an amateur. Seven, I'm sorry, 7 and 0 as an amateur. 13 and 0 as a pro. You know, I, that's uh, he may not have beaten the more notable names that that Palomino has, but he's still very impressive, man. He's still yeah. He, um, he, he has wins over yeah. Drew Fickett and Jay Z Cavacante and um Dan well Dan Lowe, the lesser Lowe's on. <laughs> <laughs> and now Melvin Guillard too. I mean, those are all good fighters. It's just interesting because I mean, I, I, there's no reason for Palomino to be out of the prime of his career. Like, we shouldn't be seeing anything less than the best Luis Palomino right now. Still, that's the yeah. thing that I I, I want to press out of this. Is that like he should still be the fighter he's been at this point in his career, and um. That fighter is really exciting and dangerous. You know, he 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 reminds me, I think, a lot of, and maybe with less of a focus, le- less submission ability, but he reminds me, to pull a recent example, of, like, Godofredo Pepe uh, as, like, one of those guys that is not, like, his process isn't great. All the tools, or maybe even, like, Uriah Hall. Like, the process with which he fights is not a great process, but he's really dangerous. And he can yeah. he, he will throw stuff out at you at any time that's really dangerous and hard to deal with. And if you can kind of nullify that, if you can stuff his game down and really keep him off balance, then he, you know, he'll lose decisions. But he's still a very dangerous, tough fighter to deal with. Yeah, it's one of those blink and you'll miss it, and you, all you all of a sudden you realize like, oh wait a minute, this guy's got me in a headlock. How did he do that? Um, yeah, it, it's uh, it's interesting. This is a very very good stylistic matchup. Palomino is pretty much, I mean, he's earned the shot as far as you know. None of the divisions are particularly deep in World Series, but uh, hey, look, if you're gonna have a guy fight Gaethje for a belt, this is as legit as uh, as a guys you're gonna get right now. And it's very much worth watching. This is this is going to be a uh, th- this will definitely cap it off and and be regardless of what happens on the undercard. This is almost guaranteed to be great action. So it's certainly very much worth watching. Yeah, I I, I do, and I am wondering if Gagey can win it. Like if he will win it, he should. You mm-hmm. know, he's obviously expected to. Yes. But that split decision to Melvin Giard, like. Even if you thought he was the clear winner of that fight, that still like that raises some eyebrows, you know, because Giard, it, like Giard, has been fighting a lot longer than uh, Luis Palomino, actually. Like Giard yes. is a lot more worn of a fighter and a worn down talent than Palomino is at this stage in his career. And yeah. Gagey takes uh, chances, you know. Yes. Yes. I mean, hasn't Gillard been fighting? Hasn't he been like he started boxing at 15 or 16 or something like that? Like actually yeah, having I mean, bouts? I mean, something crazy like that, right? Gillard's only 31. Like he's a year, you know. He, he's like our age, and he he started fighting in 2002. So, you know, 18, 17. <sighs> That's the year I graduated high school. 17. Mm-hmm. Melvin Gillard was a pro fighter in MMA. That's and amazing. and that's that's just MMA. That's not counting boxing boxing and kickboxing, which you had done before. So I mean you yeah. consider that yeah. Yeah. So wow. you know, I mean that that's he's kinda like the classic tale where I say like guys who start in their teens are almost always done by thirty. Like you don't <laughs> see people who start that early keep, you know, they don't keep fighting successfully past 30, usually. Almost ever. It can't, yeah. happens rarely, yeah. but it doesn't happen that often. And um, so it, it, I have questions then with Gagey, like, he takes risks. He can get hit. He tends to come in with his head down, winging big, like, power strikes, and puts himself off balance doing it. 
And it's the kind of thing, like, Palomino, the guys who tend to beat him, are really patient, controlled fighters. You know, people like, you know, for as little as I'm impressed by him, but like Efrain Escudero isn't a chancy fighter. You know, he's very much a sit on his back foot, wait for his opportunities, wrestle, box. Um, Pat Curran, you know, really controlling, really grinding fighter. Eve Edwards is maybe, like, that might be the best port of, like, you know, of somebody like Gagey and who, who has beaten Palomino. So it'll be interesting to see. I don't know. I, I, I'll be interested to see if Gagey, uh, if, his ch- if his risk, if his pressure throws Palomino off or if his risk-taking just puts him in danger constantly, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, that's, I, it's that's, definitely uh, that's pretty fight. accurate. That sounds very accurate, and that's probably what makes it so compelling. It's There's a legitimate feeling of a challenge. We're going to probably see Gagey dig deep here and uh, probably have to pull some other tools out of his box here and, and, and make something happen. And that's always a fun thing to see. You want to see that in your champion. You want to see someone who's, you know, well, in, in, a dominant champion is also good. But in this particular case, you want to see where these guys are at. And, again, much respect to World Series of Fighting for putting that bout together. That was great. So, yeah. Yeah. So, all told, this is a pretty decent card. Like, you know... Stark Stars Mendy and Hamill Silva may not be that exciting, but West vs. Valiev, Holder vs. Hewen, and Gagey vs. Palomino, those are all really fun fights. Um, on, a night, on a Saturday night without a lot else going on, it's worth catching. Yes, very much so. I'm a little disappointed that the, uh, the Thursday experiment doesn't seem to be something that they're sticking to. I like the Thursday night uh, showtime, but hey, look, there's nothing else really going on. Um, or is there? Is there any other? Uh, there's no event this There's a Bellator right? event tomorrow night, but okay. Well, then that's not that bad. I don't. I don't. It's it's good not to have a crowded fight week. Uh, should be noted. Just a few minor things we forgot that, or I should say, I forgot. Uh, Honey Marks was the opponent that uh, Tiago Silva was initially going to take on. He got injured, which led to Matt Hamill being in. Kind of a disappointment, but we'll see him down the line as well. Uh. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I, Honey Marks is like, I mean, he's better than Tiago Silva and Hamill right now. I think yeah. he's probably a bit, maybe not, maybe not Silva. I don't know. I have to see more of Silva again to really figure out what's going on with him. I mean, so much. There so, seems to be so much going on with his head and with his training and how out of shape he's getting that mm-hmm. it's really hard to judge just where he's at. But yeah. that is too bad. Um, it is. Otherwise, yeah, any other notes? Uh, just minor stuff here. Uh, Tyrone Spong is still boxing. I don't know if he's ever going to come back to MMA in general or if he's going to come back to uh, World Series of Fighting, but we're still waiting, Tyrone. Do something. You're <laughs> our only hope. Uh, also, uh, April 6th is the deadline for Sean Lattman to turn himself into authorities in uh, Clark County, Nevada. So. TikTok, Sean. Uh, it's funny because uh, World Series of Fighting, ever since that whole thing blew up and he's sentenced, they've done so much better. And I don't know, I don't want to say that he's holding them back because I don't know how deep his involvement was, but it's kind of curious that all of a sudden he has to go to jail and they start blossoming uh, in a strange way. So uh, that's pretty much all I got. Looking forward to this event and hoping that it pays off. Yeah, indeed. All right. On that note, we are definitely done. Um, remember to give us a like uh, if you're watching this on YouTube. That's the thumbs up thing. You can follow me uh, at D Zane Simon on Twitter and Victor at Vic M Rodriguez on Twitter. You can find us mm-hmm. both on Bloody Elbow. If you find Victor on Bloody Elbow, you know, give him a wide berth or he'll drop the hammer on you. <laughs> and uh, we'll have a, 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 a Bellator vivisection, although uh, this might go up after it, so that. In the timeline of things, forget that. Who knows? Uh, anyway, thanks for joining me, and uh, you know, stick around, people.